Well, it's wonderful to um, be back with you. Uh, we had a great time. Um, Kathy and I went to uh, a place called Allen's Park. You know, anybody know anybody know where that is? It's you go to Lions, and if you go right, you go to Estes Park. You go left, you go to Allen's Park, and there was a uh, retreat ground up there, and we had a pastor and wives uh, retreat, and there was eight couples, and it was great. We we were fed, we were taught, we had good fellowship, and um, but it's great to be back with you. And everything I heard, Bill did a great job, and so thankful uh, for him filling in for me. You know, um, there are basically two kinds of people in the world. There are those that like to follow the instruction manual or the recipe or the plan of action, and there are those that like to wing it, right? And, and my guess is if we, um, we were to take a survey, it might be close to half and half, and chances are pretty good that um, if you like to follow the instructions, your, your spouse, if you're married, probably is the other way. They, they like to wing it. Isn't that true? Because there's just something about us that uh, we marry opposites most of the time. I had a professor that taught a marriage and family class uh, in seminary that said, if you're exactly alike, one of you is unnecessary. So maybe that's why we're all so different. And just to kind of make a confession, I'm uh, the former. I'm the instruction manual guy. I'm, I'm the follow the recipe exactly guy. Um, I'm not very good at winging it. I need to follow the directions. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, if I don't have the directions, I, I kind of panic. Let's uh, <laughs> Okay, everybody that wants to wing it, sit on that side of the car. <laughs> Throw away your outlines. The rest of us will go with the outline. <laughs> well, in our study of Paul's letter to Titus, we now come to a section that spells out what Titus is to teach the believers in Crete concerning how to live as God's people. If you, if you remember, this, this letter, this brief letter is... Uh, kind of a letter of instructions, because Paul has left his associate Titus in this island of Crete to kind of get things in order. Uh, The believers had come back, most people believe, from uh, Pentecost and the time of celebration in Jerusalem. They brought the gospel back to their own country, and they were starting fellowship groups and churches, but yet they needed more instruction. And especially considering the culture of Crete, that Crete was a a very immoral, ungodly area, and so they needed instruction. And you know, as I thought about that, what about us? In the United States today, we need instruction in God's Word. We, We need to get back to some of the basics of what it means and how to live as God's people. And so that's what he does, is he gives us some specific instructions on what to teach different groups in the church. And he begins in chapter 2, I'm going to just go ahead and read the section I'm going to be talking to us about, uh, verses 1 to 10. It says, but you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. And in the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They're to teach what is good. So that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children and to be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Slaves are to submit to their masters and everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn adorn the teaching of God our Savior in everything. So he begins by saying that uh, what you need to teach the churches is what appropriately goes along with sound doctrine. Everything is to be taught in accord with God's Word. And I I did some study this week, and uh, 
I just uh, I was curious to see how this was worded in different English translations. And I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible, and, and it says, but you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. The NIV says you're to teach what's appropriate to sound doctrine. The English Standard says you're to teach which, what accords with sound doctrine. A New American Standard says things which are fitting for sound doctrine. The New English Translation says you're to communicate behavior that goes with sound teaching. And the New Living says, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. When I, when I first read this, I, I thought that it was saying that you need to teach sound doctrine or you need to teach um, the right beliefs. But actually, it goes beyond that and it's saying you need to teach what's in accord with God's Word. In other words, the application of it. What it looks like in, in everyday life. And, and I think both are important and crucial. It's important to know the beliefs of the faith. You need to know that Jesus is God and that he died for our sins, that he rose from the dead, and that we need to understand the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the fact that everybody is a sinner and needs to be saved. Those are the things that we need to believe, but he says also those things that accompany that, those things that are in accord with that. In other words, how we're to live out our lives. Everything is to be taught in accord with God's Word. The, the word for sound here refers to that which is healthy. It, it's a medical term, and it's like a, a, a sound bone, one that isn't diseased or, or broken. And here it's the opposite of false teaching. So sound doctrine is that which is healthy, that which is reliable. And the doctrine part refers to the content of God's Word. So he's saying, how do we apply these beliefs? You might know the right beliefs. You might have memorized the right beliefs. You might have a, a doctrinal statement. But you need more than that. You need to know how to live it out practically. Because you probably realize this. There's a lot of things, a lot of issues that we face today that is not specifically addressed in Scripture. Um, there isn't a, a book of the Bible that talks about Here's the movies that you're allowed to see. Here's the TV shows that you should watch with your kids or not watch. Uh, here's how you should vote on certain political issues. Uh, here's how you decide whether or not it's time to put your parents in a, in a nursing home. Here's how you should use social media. None of those things are addressed specifically in Scripture, but yet there are principles that we can draw from Scripture. That's what he's talking about here, drawing things that are consistent with sound doctrine or correct teaching. So I think that's something that takes time. I don't think as a, as a new believer I understood that. I was always looking for a specific verse. And I remember I grew up in a pretty strict church that said that you're not supposed to dance. And so I remember trying to find that verse in the Bible. And, and, and we can do that with a lot of things. I've heard people say that like with marijuana. Well, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible you can't smoke marijuana. Well, is there principles? Yeah, I, I believe there are. And so that's something that takes some time to, as you study God's Word, as you follow the leading of the Spirit, to come up with principles, uh, general ideas that apply to passages that speak very directly. So the role of Christian leaders has to do with the Word of God. The role of Christian leaders is to know and to teach and to live God's Word. Not just be good teachers and not just know a lot of facts, but be able to live it out as well. One of the things I think that kind of goes along with this whole idea is that methods may change according to the times and the culture, but the content of the teaching remains the same. And so I think sometimes people get confused and they mix those up and they think, you know what, the methods are sacred. So in other words, if a hundred years ago we had tent meetings, then that's what we should do today. Or if we had certain structures or programs, and that's what we have to do today. Now, I really believe the programs and the methods are flexible, and they should be adaptable to the culture. And so that's why I think it's, it's helpful for a lot of people uh, to use media, to use videos, to use podcasts, to have home Bible studies and small groups and Sunday school classes and retreats. Uh, those things aren't, aren't really in the Bible specifically on how to do it, 
But the principle is there. We need to be in the word of God. We need to be fellowshipping with one another. We need to encourage one another. We need to live out God's truth. But the way we do it might be different. But on the other hand, the other extreme is some people say, well, not only are the methods flexible and the way we do it and the programs that we have, but God's word is flexible too. In other words, we could change it for what fits with us. And that's a danger because that's wrong. That, that's exactly against what God's Word says. You see, God's Word is sufficient and it's complete. In 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Everything that we need for our spiritual life is in God's Word. Either in direct statements and doctrine, or in principles that we can apply to our lives. And so now Paul tells Titus, here are some specifics. I want you to address certain groups in the church, and he begins with older men. And, you know, the good thing is he doesn't say what age that is. So I guess we can kind of guess at what that is. I always think um, an older man is somebody that's older than me, so... I, that way I never actually get to that category. But probably a lot of you think, nope, too late. You're way past it. Um, but anyway, this, this refers to their physical age, not necessarily the office of elder because it's a similar word used. And when we talked about qualifications of an elder, we talked about the fact that these are mature men. But this is just talking in general to mature men. If you don't like the term older, you can say mature. And one of the things I see in studying Scripture is Christian maturity is defined more by what we're to be than what we're to do. And that's something that I see in this passage. It doesn't give a lot of descriptions of what we're to do if we're mature men, but how we're to be. And on your outlines, it's a little bit longer outline, partly because I wanted to not only talk about each of these descriptions, but I also wanted to give the different translations. And so like this first one in, one, in one particular translation says they're to be temperate. Well, temperate, I don't know what that means. I don't use the word temperate too much. But other translations said sober-minded or self-controlled, and that, that kind of helped me. The idea here is clear-headed, that this, the, the mature person is going to be wise and have sound judgment. He's going to be one who's, who's vigilant and alert. And I want you to take a minute, and I don't, I don't want you to say it out loud, but think of somebody that you'd put in this category. Uh, a mature man, that would be someone that you would think of as self-controlled, temperate, sober-minded. Someone that you would go to for advice. Got a picture in your head of who that might be? There's been people in my life I can think of. The next description is worthy of respect or dignified or reverent. It's the idea of dignity that invites honor and respect, one who seeks what is noble and honorable. And, you know, some of these are, are hard to think about people like this. Um, and I don't know if there's something that's changed in our generation, but there are people that I can remember, most of them have passed away, that just their presence was worthy of respect. Maybe a grandfather that you have or, or maybe a friend of your family that you know that this is what that person was to be like. This was not like how the people were in Crete. And so this is how he needed to instruct them. Uh, the next one is, is a similar uh, word um, as the first one, which was temperate. In fact, it's translated temperate in some other translations. It's the idea of self-controlled or sensible or temperate. Self-discipline is another word for it. One who measures his words and controls his actions has self-restraint with his passions and desires under control. As I was thinking about some of these things, I was thinking about um, I'm on the district leadership team for the Rocky Mountain District of the Evangelical Free Church. And one of the things we're looking at is at some point, I don't know, in the next year or two, three, maybe uh, our district superintendent, Greg Fell, is going to be retiring. And so we're trying to put together a, a job description and what kind of character qualities um, and background we want in our next district superintendent. And so these are some of the things. And I thought, 
why not go to Scripture first and look at some of these qualities? One that uh, is self-controlled, one who's worthy of respect, sober-minded. He's one that has his passions under control. I think that's very important. And then it says, sound in faith, love, and endurance. Uh, Faith, first of all, sound in faith means he knows what he believes. And and he knows why. He's not someone that's wishy-washy. That you ask him one day, uh, what do you believe about this? He'll give you an answer. And then you ask him another day and he'll completely change his mind. He's consistent in his faith. Also, he's sound in love. He has a growing, healthy relationship with God and with others. You know, one of the sad things that I see uh, too often is there are some people that are great leaders, but they're not good in relationships. Uh, I know of one particular Christian author and speaker, and um, I don't know him, but a friend of mine had him at his church to speak, and he said he was horrible to his assistant. He just treated him like nothing. And I thought, you know what? That affects how I think about a person. Because it's not just your knowledge, it's also how you relate to people that has an impact. And then also it says to be sound in endurance or sound in patience or steadfastness. That's the idea of having a proven track record of living well, even in trials, even in difficulties, even in pain. He's a person that presses on even during hard times. And so, whether or not you consider yourself an older man or a a mature man, guys, what about you? Do these qualities describe you? Uh, Are you a person that um, people seek out for counsel? And a person that people look up to? And then another question, who are your mentors? Who, Who do you go to when you need wisdom? Or who do you model your life after. I think of several in my life. Um, The first one was, uh, his name was John Stanley. His his name is John Stanley, still around. He was my youth pastor when I was a a freshman in college. And he really helped me understand how you can be a godly man and not just be a weird person. I don't know why I had this weird conception of of, um, Christians and godly people. But this guy was cool, he played the guitar, he was real athletic, and he was just a great guy, but he also loved God, and he loved God's Word, and he was a real model for me. Uh, another was um, one of the first pastors I worked under when I worked as a, as a youth pastor. His name was Jerry Westcott, and Jerry was a guy that was very real. He would um, bring me and the other youth director in, and we'd have meetings every week, and we'd talk about just real things in life. And he was a, a great example to me. Um, others was uh, my next pastor who was um, Chuck Swindoll at the First E Free Church in Fullerton, California. And he was a, a real model of what it means to preach God's Word in a, in a practical way. And he's always been a blessing to me. And then most recently, Greg Fell, our district superintendent. He's always a guy I can go to and ask questions about all kinds of things in ministry, and a, a real godly man. So, so that's the specific instructions that were given to mature men, older men. And then he moves on to older women. And again, this is a, a title probably most of us aren't going to say, yeah, I'm an older woman, right? Uh, what's the age for older women? Gosh, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to say. But back in those days, <laughs> that, that wasn't... Uh, that wasn't something that was a, a negative term. It was something that was actually a, a term of honor. And there's something wrong with our society that older people, it's almost thought of as an insult to think of yourself as older rather than being a, a person of honor. But anyway, as we get into this, starting in verse uh, 3, it says, In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior. In the same way, in other words, similar to the mature men in the way that they live with respect and and dignity. Uh, I looked this up in the King James and it uses an interesting term. It says, as becometh holiness, as becometh holiness. In other words, it goes in line with being holy. (coughs) Excuse me a second. 
And then it moves on to uh, not slanderers. And you know, as I looked through these lists, I thought, why are certain characteristics um, listed for certain groups? And uh, I'm not going to say, but one of them, at least my guess is for the women of Crete, was they had a tendency to be gossips. They had a tendency to be ones that, that falsely accused or spread false rumors. And so he's saying that this isn't how you're to be. You're not to be slanderers. In fact, that, that word there for slander is, is diabolos. Does anybody know what diabolos, how we translate that usually? The devil. The devil is called a slanderer, and that's what that word comes from. And so we don't want to be like Satan, but yet we are when we falsely accuse other people, when we speak bad about people. So an older woman, as she grows in her Christian faith, is to be one that doesn't falsely accuse, but rather one who speaks truth with grace. And then another interesting characteristic is not slaves are not addicted to much wine. One translation said excessive drinking. Um, And this one has to do with self-control in this area. It's required for Christian maturity. And you know, um, I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up in a very fundamental Christian strict home. And, I, and I've shared that with you before, that, that we, we used to joke that the, the big thing was, uh, you know, you don't smoke or drink or chew or go with girls that do. And those were like the worst sins, were, were smoking and, and drinking. And, you know, it's, it's interesting how things have changed because now in, in the church um, that isn't that big a deal, and maybe rightfully so. Is smoking and drinking the two worst sins in the world? Probably not. There's probably a lot of worse things than that. But I think we can go to the opposite extreme and say, let's just, you know, live it up and do what we want. I mean, I was at a, I probably shouldn't say this, but I was at a pastor's gathering, and after our meeting, they went to the bar. These pastors all went to the bar. I didn't go, and probably half of us didn't go. But I thought, what, is that cool that you can go out and go to the bar and have a drink? You know, and I'm not saying in moderation it's wrong to drink, but for me, that's not a good Christian testimony. And I think one of the things is we have a tendency to go from one extreme to another. So in other words, if you grew up in a very strict teetotaler kind of home, then you can swing to the other side and say, you know what, I'm free in Christ and so I can drink. And then it, it kind of shows itself. Uh, I know some of you hate Facebook and probably don't like it when I mention Facebook, but I'm really sad to see so many posts, and, and honestly, it's mostly women that talk about how much they need their wine, and how after a hard day, they got to have their wine, and you know, everything's about wine, and I just think, you know what, maybe they're joking, but I have a feeling that maybe there's some seriousness there too, that I, I don't know if that's something you want to promote. There are people that struggle with alcoholism. And I don't want to make something like that as, this is fine, this is acceptable, this is cool, let's joke about, you know, needing our our wine all the time. Um, Paul saw this as important for the ladies at Crete, that they weren't to be slaves to much wine or addicted to excessive drinking. And then the next one is teach what is good in verse 4. And it's specifically to the young women, that they were to be teachers of the younger women. They were to pass on Christian values to them. And to me, this shows the importance of personal discipleship and mentoring, not just for women, but for men as well, and for counseling and for teaching among the ladies. You know, there was a time when I was studying counseling that there was a big question about should male pastors counsel um, women? And I remember one, one of my profs said, you know what? Scripture takes care of that by saying it's the older women that are to instruct the younger women. That's part of their responsibility. And you know, I'm so thankful for those in our church that do that. There are many ladies here that have incredible gifts of teaching. And I'm so thankful that they're involved in teaching the women or teaching the children or teaching the teenagers. Because I think everybody, whether it's young men, need Uh, father figures and need dads and need other men to be role models. It's the same for the ladies. 
that, that it's important that if God has gifted you in that area, that you use it. And it might not be formally. It might not be in a Sunday school class or in a Bible study. It, it might be just casually. Um, it might be with your kids or with your grandkids that you pass on those values that God's design is for women to assume this role and responsibility rather than just pass it on to pastors or elders or, or even husbands. It's an important role. And so the application thought I had was, ladies, do you have spiritual friends? Do you have mentors and counselors or, or soul sisters, as we, we call it here, that you can share your life with? Um, don't be so busy that you don't have these spiritual relationships because it makes all the difference. And then maybe a challenge. Are you willing to invest time? Are you willing to mentor younger women? There are so many today with so many broken homes where there isn't good role models and more than anything, that's what they need. That young men and young women need people that will notice them and be willing to spend time with them and to mentor them and to provide good role models for them. And so then that moves us to younger women and um, as I've already read this passage, you see in there some of the, the roles given to younger women. And it, it seems like it's against what our culture says. In a culture where they're trying to say everything's the same, that there are no different roles for men and women, it's kind of a struggle sometimes to allow this message to come through. And I, I read an article that I thought was great that kind of talked about this. It says, in the increasing politically correct society in which we live, there's a push to remove any distinction between the sexes. But there are many differences that cannot be ignored. Consider a few of them. There are differences when it comes to nicknames. If Laura, Kate, and Susan go out to lunch, they will call each other Laura, Kate, and Susan. But if Mike, Dave, and John go out to lunch, they will affectionately refer to each other as Fat Boy, Godzilla, and Four Eyes. There are differences when it comes to money. A man will pay $2 for a $1 item he needs. A woman will pay $1 for a $2 item she doesn't need, but it's on sale. <laughs> there are differences when it comes to items kept in the bathroom. A man has six items in his bathroom. Toothbrush and toothpaste, shaving cream, razor, and a bar of soap and a towel. The average number of items in a typical woman's bathroom is 337. A man would not be able to identify more than 20 of these items. There are differences in arguments. A woman has the last word in any argument. Anything a man says after that is the beginning of a new argument. There are differences when it comes to dressing up. A woman will dress up to go shopping, water the plants, empty the trash, answer the phone, read a book, and get the mail. A man will dress up for church weddings and funerals. There are differences when it comes to sleeping at night. Men wake up as good-looking as when they went to bed. I don't know if I should say this one. <laughs> Women somehow deteriorate during the night. <laughs> I'm just reading it. I didn't write this. There's a difference when it comes to children. A woman knows all about her children. She knows about dentist appointments and best friends, favorite foods, secret fears, hopes, and dreams. The man is vaguely aware of some short people living in the house. There's a difference. And so as we think about instructions given, there are some differences there. And this one where it talks about um, what to teach the younger women, it says, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and love their children. After their priority and their devotion to the Lord, married women should give priority to husbands and children, a husband and children. And I, I think too often today our culture tells us that the home isn't important, that your role as a, as a wife and a mother isn't as important as your job. God's Word says that should be a priority. And though it doesn't say it specifically, I, I think that's not just for wives. It's for husbands as well. And then it, it, another word of description is self-controlled, and this one has been used twice already. It's the idea of good judgment, self-discipline. Uh, pure, talking about morality, living above reproach. Uh, workers are busy at home. Again, the, the focus is on homemaking uh, over 
an outside job. Not saying you can't work outside, but there should be a focus on the home. And then kind, which is full of goodwill and compassion, tender-hearted. And then in submission to their husbands, meaning supporting his leadership and his direction. And, you know, this isn't just mentioned once. It's mentioned over and over again in Scripture in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 and 1 Peter 3. And the reason it says here is that by usurping their husband's leadership, people would then look unfavorably upon God's word. It says so that God's word will not be slandered. That that's, that's something that's important as, as a testimony. So for young ladies, where does your idea or ideal of womanhood come from? Does it come from celebrities or politicians or famous athletes or from godly examples? Are there people you know that you can model the way you live after? And then secondly, will you seek out mature women of God to spend time with? My suggestion is for, for young guys and young ladies, get together with somebody. If there's somebody that you know that you look up to, that you admire, that you think might be a good resource, give them a call or talk to them after church and say, can we get coffee sometime? And then just... Ask questions. And you know what? I guess I'm close enough to being an older man to know that's something that's very flattering. That as an older person, you want to feel like, you know what? I've lived all these years. I've learned all these things. I've made all these mistakes, not just for me, but it's to be able to pass that on to somebody else. And so my guess is um, if you ask somebody to go get lunch or get coffee just to pick their brain and talk to them about things, they'd be flattered, they'd be glad to. And if not, then move on to the next person. That God has provided within this body, this fellowship of believers, godly men and women that need to be passing on some of that to the younger generation. And then he moves to younger men, starting in verse 6. He says, In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. I thought it was interesting that all of these have several qualities, but when it gets to young men, it just says self-controlled. Maybe that tells us something, that that's an area that young men need, that uh, this is the main thing to be taught. And it's used a number of times. And it should be emphasized about controlling thoughts and passions and actions. And if you don't realize it, young men have a tendency to be overzealous, to be violent, to be lustful, to be angry. And so self-control is a huge area for younger men. And he's telling Titus, you can be this, not only in your teaching, but also in your example, you're going to model this. And he talks about good works, living graciously, being generous, giving to others. He talks about your teaching. He says your integrity and your dignity in your teaching, uh, the way you teach, in your speech, that it's sound and beyond reproach, that you don't have words that people will use against you because they're not appropriate. And again, the reason is to be able to silence critics by the way we live. In other words, people that say, oh, I don't, I don't believe in that Christian message. When they look at your life, they won't be able to come up with a reason on the way you live, on the way you model your Christian faith. And so a good application thought is, do you live to bring honor to the Lord? Is that, is that your priority? Is that your goal? And then for some of the younger guys, or really for any of us, are you accountable? Are you accountable with one or two other uh, Christian men Uh, to help you grow in this area of self-control. That's one of the reasons we have our men's group is so that guys can can talk, that there's a safe environment where we can share our struggles, that we can be accountable with one another, pray for one another, and encourage one another. And I know the ladies do this as well. And then the final group he he moves to in verses 9 and 10 is he gives instructions to those who are under authority at work. In that culture, it, it was slaves. Um, And he says, slaves are to submit to their masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn adorn the teaching of God our Savior in everything. 
So the first thing he says is, as one under authority in your job, submit to authority. Be pleasing to them. Be obedient. Don't talk back. Don't be argumentative. He says to be trustworthy, uh, faithful, and honest, not stealing. What I understand, one of the things that uh, causes uh, prices to be raised is because of theft in the workplace. Whether it's supplies or equipment or time or profits, be trustworthy, be honest. And again, the reason is so that people will see the message of Jesus Christ as something attractive, something positive. You know, today there are so many, many people that we rub shoulders with, that we come into contact with, that they'll never, or they have never been in church. They've never read the Bible. Um, The only gospel they read is you and I. If they look at you and they say, that person claims to be a follower of Christ, what does their life look like? Is that something that I want? And so uh, maybe a challenging question is, do you have a good testimony in your work? Where people say, I want to be like that person. I, I want to know more about their faith. As we conclude, I think there's something for all of us today. And I don't pretend to know exactly what it is for you. But my hope is that you'll underline something, you'll jot something down, that, that you'll think about one area of your life, perhaps, that God wants to be at work on. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for instruction from your word. Thank you that you haven't left us alone to just try to figure it out, but you have given us clear instruction and teaching. And not only that, you have provided us with godly examples throughout history, in scripture, but also right here today. There are many here that are great models of what it means to live for you. So Lord, I I pray that we would rub off on each other, that we would be willing to spend time with one another and encourage one another, and that we would be a resource for those that are younger or less mature spiritually, that we can be a help to them. And that if there's anyone here that doesn't know Christ, that they would take that step of faith today, that they'd acknowledge their sin, that they'd turn from their sin and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, that all of us would continue to be learners. That, that we wouldn't say, well, I've got it together, I've, I've arrived and I don't need to grow anymore. But that all of us can learn from each other. And that we can continue to learn from your word. We just thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. I've had a lot of role models in my life.